Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? There's a collection of Mac aficionados who are very passionate about their computers and often know way more about how they work than the average user. But these people didn't buy their machines from Apple, they built them themselves. This time, let's talk about the Hackintosh. So the Hackintosh, it's probably a term that you've heard, but in case you haven't, it's simply the concept of running Apple's Mac operating system on non-Apple branded hardware. And it's been going on for quite a while now, but to fully understand the movement behind this, we need to take a look at Apple's history because what's going on now is a bit of a repeat of what's happened before. You see, Apple has always tied its software and hardware together in its product. It, it was always wanted to control the whole experience. And this concept is pretty well known. It's been Apple's modus operandi ever since the beginning. But what's not quite so well known is that there have been clone Apple products throughout the year, also pretty much since the beginning. There have been Apple II compatible machines like the Laser 128 and the Franklin A series. Some of these were completely reverse engineered and others simply copied Apple's ROM code and faced the consequences in some cases. But even after the Apple II, there have been many Macintosh clones throughout the decades. Early clones, like the outbound laptop, used the ROM chips from an actual Mac in order to function. But by the mid-1990s, Apple began to officially license its OS to clone manufacturers, and a whole ton of different machines appeared on the market some of them from companies that popped up just to build Mac clones, others from existing Mac vendors that hadn't built their own full computers before, and some even from vendors that were well known and decided to branch into the computer market. But clones ultimately hurt Apple for various reasons, and so around the time that Steve Jobs came back to Apple in the late 90s, the licensing program was effectively just killed off. So that brings us to the mid 2000s, and that's when Apple announced its switch from the PowerPC processors to Intel's x86 platform. It said that for the pr previous several years, it had been secretly building versions of its Mac OS X operating system that ran on the x86 platform. And this was a bit of a bombshell to people. It was around the time pretty well rumored that Apple was going to be making that switch to Intel. However, what people figured was that transition to Intel would take quite a while, that Apple would announce maybe its first few machines and it would be kind of like going through the original OS X transition again, where things were pretty buggy and didn't necessarily work all that great right off the bat. It, it would take some time to get there. But the fact that Apple had been planning that Intel transition for several years prior and had actually worked a lot of the bugs out of the Intel version of its operating system really floored people. I remember being very surprised, not at the news of moving to Intel, but at the fact that Apple had actually basically been doing it for quite a while. And the transition to Intel on Apple's own hardware was actually incredibly smooth. The machines that came out were very fast, very much a better value. And the big thing was Apple was able to completely change its entire product lineup from PowerPC to Intel in just the span of a little over a year. It was actually very quick and it was fairly painless, especially since Apple had written in a software translation layer to be able to allow PowerPC apps to work natively on Intel hardware at relatively decent speed. But the big thing behind that transition is that it also not only meant like faster computers for the average Mac user, 
But for those who are technically inclined, it presented a really interesting challenge. I mean, since Macs were effectively becoming regular PCs, a lot of them wondered, well, could OS X be run on standard hardware? And the answer ended up being yes. And thus the Macintosh became a PC and the Hackintosh movement was born. So it's been around for over a decade now. And the novelty, I would say, has probably worn off by now. So why do people still build Hackintoshes? I mean, I think the original appeal was really just the classic to see if you can do it type of mentality. That novelty has worn off. Why are people actually still going to the trouble of building a Hackintosh? Well, I'd say it's largely for the same reason that people bought those Apple clones throughout the years. First, to get better specifications or control over the hardware. Macs have continued to become more and more integrated and offer more and more limited hardware choices especially with, at this point, the fact that they are pretty much not upgradable or expandable. If you want to, like in a few years, maybe make your Mac more powerful, you pretty much have to get rid of it and buy a new one. Of course, going to a Hackintosh, well, kind of eliminates some of that because it's a feature that PC users have been enjoying since the beginning. If you want more RAM, if you want a bigger hard drive, if you want to put in a faster processor, expansion cards, anything like that, well, the sky's pretty much the limit and even to some extent for PC laptop users, although the story's been kind of changing for them too. But it's, it's really that idea of taking control of the hardware and being able to decide exactly what parts and pieces you want in it to best suit your own needs. Maybe you have specific demands and requirements that Apple's current lineup of hardware just doesn't meet all that well. A great example is the kind of mid-performance, mid-price tower PC market. Apple hasn't really offered kind of an every, you know, average, everyday just tower that you can plug your own monitor and keyboard and mouse into. It's always been the low end, that is the Mac Mini, or the high end with the Mac Pro, but nothing right down the middle where people like me could very benefit from it. I don't necessarily need a workstation class computer, but I'd like something with a decent amount of performance and some upgradability as I want to maybe further with what I'm doing in terms of multimedia content, that sort of thing, the transition from 1080p to 4K video required a pretty decent bump in processor performance and all that. For a lot of people who are into creative work and multimedia content, that sort of thing, it would very much benefit them. And I think a lot of those people are the ones who have gone out and jumped on this Hackintosh bandwagon because Apple otherwise doesn't sell a computer that suits their needs all that well, otherwise they would have to go into a much more expensive machine. The other reason why I think Hackintoshing is still relatively popular these days is because of price. Apple's machines for a while were actually pretty decently price compatible with what you could get out of a Windows PC, and I've done a video about this that everyone loved to give me shit about, but there have been specific machines throughout the years that have managed to hit really decent price points that were fairly comparable, but that's been changing over time as some products have simply not been updated in quite a while or other products have been pursuing an even higher end type of user like the iMac Pro that starts at $5,000. Yes, you w could say that's a comparable machine in terms of price to a Windows-based workstation. But again, it comes back to that hole in the product lineup. I think a lot of people who buy an iMac Pro don't necessarily need an iMac Pro. They simply need something more powerful than the other machines that Apple offers. So... By building your own machine, you are able to pick those parts and you can often get a better price for it overall than if you were to buy a machine actually from Apple. 
So with all that in mind, why hasn't everyone just gone and built a Hackintosh? I mean, when Apple's clone program was official in the mid 90s, those clones almost killed Apple because they were so much better priced than the machines that Apple was putting out themselves. Well, there's a few reasons. And I think one of the biggest ones is that it can take a lot of effort to build a Hackintosh and it still doesn't have guaranteed results. You see, the Hackintosh community relies on being able to basically work around limitations that Apple builds into the operating system. Apple doesn't want to make it easy for you to run Mac OS on hardware that it didn't sell you. Now, thankfully, those limitations have been relatively minor throughout the years and fairly easy to circumvent. The Hackintosh community is full of very smart and very talented people, and they generally figure out ways to work around what limitations there are and continue to move that platform forward. But things like hardware drivers have always been a challenge. Apple only needs to include drivers in the OS for hardware it itself sells and builds into its own computers. Sometimes those drivers are reusable with standard PC components like ones that define the platform architecture or chipsets, that sort of thing. And other times they don't. Maybe there's a particular piece of hardware you want to use that just will never work because no one ever wrote a driver for it. Maybe it's a fairly esoteric piece of hardware. And if you don't know how to write drivers yourself, well, you might be stuck. So some people have managed to kind of hack their way through some of this modifying drivers or simply swapping out parts for ones that work well enough with the out of box drivers. In some cases, some third-party manufacturers have actually gone to the trouble of writing Mac drivers. NVIDIA is a great example. NVIDIA has, for quite a while now, been offering Mac drivers for its video cards. Ostensibly, it's to officially support the people running the old, like, cheese grater-style Mac Pros that did have user-replaceable video cards in them but I'm pretty sure NVIDIA also knows that a lot of people running those drivers are installing them on Hackintoshes and not official Apple hardware. And I also personally kind of think that NVIDIA is maybe a little bit salty at Apple because Apple used to do business with NVIDIA and even had some Macs based on NVIDIA's chipsets. And for the past several years, Apple has been really leaning heavily on AMD for graphics. So maybe the whole driver thing's a little bit of a middle finger towards Apple. But in any event, drivers have always been an issue. But there are even sites like Tony Mac x86 and the OS X x86 project that will recommend specific parts to give you the best compatibility down to the point of saying like if you buy these exact makes and models of parts cpu motherboard ram hard drive all of these things these are you know parts that they have gone through and verified will produce a decently running hackintosh with the minimum amount of work and in some cases it can be fairly easy if you're willing to go down that road but if you want to do something a little bit more out of the norm or a little bit more difficult, like hackintoshing a laptop, in some cases you are completely on your own. But even then, if you can get a hackintosh built and running, there's still always some risk, not just in building that system, but in keeping it running and updated. At any point, Apple could release a new software update that just completely bricks your system, either intentionally or not. Maybe some drivers got updated that limit compatibility with some of the non-Apple hardware, or maybe Apple just says enough is enough and decides to make some dramatic changes to the operating system that allow it to continue to work on official Apple hardware, but effectively kill off the rest of the community. But that does raise another really good question. Why doesn't Apple just stop hackintoshing? I mean, it's got that history of knowing that clone computers are bad for its business with the way that it does business. Why has Apple continued to tolerate it? Well, in, in the past, Apple has actually gone after the Hackintosh community, but it's generally only been when Hackintoshes are being sold. 
famous example is a company called Psystar, and this is not to be confused with that Gangnam Style guy, but they were a company that around 2008 started selling Hackintoshes. They had a web store. You could just pick out all the parts you want, say, I want this to be a Hackintosh, and they would sell you a complete machine that you would you know, take it out of the box, plug it in, turn it on, and it would boot into the Mac OS. Well, Apple, of course, caught wind of this and took them to court, citing a copyright violation. And of course, Apple won. And so Psystar went out of business in 2012. And indeed, it technically is illegal to build a Hackintosh, even if you don't plan on selling it because of specific language in the license agreement for the Mac OS and also just general concept of copyright infringement. Apple, you know, if they really wanted to, they could go after the sites that provide info about building these machines. But why don't they? Well, I have a few ideas. One is that the community is still relatively small, so it's maybe not worth Apple's time. Another is that Hackintosh builders often go for the latest and greatest hardware when they're building their machines. They want to build something that's often even better than what Apple offers. So it's quite likely that Apple keeps an eye on all of this, not just from the whole legal perspective, but I suspect that some of Apple's engineering groups keep an eye on the Hackintosh community because they want to see what the community is doing, where they're going with parts, and then what troubles that community is facing. In a way, they could be using the information gleaned from the Hackintosh community as a bit of like free R&D to help shape its future products. But I think the biggest one really is that those who build Hackintoshes or power users, especially given the difficulty that there can be in actually building one of these. And those power users are also some of Apple's staunchest supporters. They build Hackintoshes not as an FU to Apple, but rather because they just love the operating system and don't really like what Apple's doing on the hardware side. They could much more easily install Windows on their Hackintosh. It'd be way easier to do that, but they don't. So if Apple were to go after the Hackintosh community, they would have a very big and very vocal backlash that would ultimately cost Apple quite a bit of bad PR. Even though it didn't really impact a whole ton of people, it would compound on a lot of the things Apple has been doing that's been pissing off even those who buy actual Apple Mac products. Now, all that said, I do think the future of Hackintoshing is in doubt, and I suspect those who are even deeply involved in the Hackintosh community have had this go through the back of their minds. As I mentioned in a previous podcast, it's rumored that Apple is gonna be switching from the Intel chip platform to AM uh, to uh, ARM-based chips in maybe the next few years. Uh, I, I think it's clear that Apple has become a bit unhappy with Intel and its rate of progress. And Apple has been getting a lot more performance out of its ARM-based processors that it's been using in things like iPhones and iPads. Over the last few years, it seems like it's able to push that platform along quite a bit faster. So it's generally being accepted that within the next few years, Apple is gonna start transitioning Macs over from Intel to ARM. And when that happens, well, that's going to be the beginning of the end. And ultimately, Hackintoshing will die off when Apple stops shipping x86 versions of the Mac OS. So I guess you could say, in a way, while Apple has periodically lost this battle, it's been losing the Hackintosh battle for 12-ish plus years now. Ultimately, in the coming years, it will end up winning the clone computer war. So with all that said, I'm curious as to your thoughts. Do you have experience building a Hackintosh? Are you using one right now? Have you tried it in the past? 
Has it worked out for you or has it been too big of a challenge? I've tried it a little bit here and there throughout the years and sometimes it's worked really well and sometimes it hasn't, but ultimately, that worry about long-term support and whether my computer will even work the next day after a software update has kept me on actual Apple hardware, but maybe that's the same for some of you, maybe it's not. I'm just curious as to your thoughts, so be sure to share them down in the comments below. Also, if you're interested in audio-only versions of these podcasts, I have them available as plain MP3 downloads for Patreon supporters. You can also get a private RSS feed, throw it into the podcast player of your choice, and these episodes go live a few days before they show up on YouTube, so it's a great way to help support the channel. Anyway, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always... Thanks for watching.